And we know the, the, the events that's taken place. We know that the Jewish people is, is facing uh, um, an alleation. And, and that Esther, Queen Esther, she's in the king's palace. And she is being petitioned by Mordecai to go to the king. Mordecai is telling Esther that you must go and seek counsel for the king or else we're going to die. But catch this. He told Esther that if you don't do this, God will raise someone up that will save the Jewish people. But you and your household could possibly die. So let's pick this up in Esther chapter 4. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start uh, uh, in verse 11 because most of you know this passage to heart. In verse 11 it says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law. Put all to death, except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have been called to go to the king, or yet, she says, I myself have not been called to go to the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish." Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I want to focus on that passage today. For such a time as this. And, and, and I want to make a connection to where we are today because I believe at some point in the conversation back and forth between uh, 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 the servants going back and forth between Mordecai and Esther, at some point I believe Esther come to realize that this was a divine appointment from God. That He had placed her right there for that very purpose to save His people. Now today, I will tell you that we're not being threatened as American citizens to annihilate America, but as Christians, we are being challenged. And I will tell you, this country that was birthed on Christianity, that our Constitution is so full of the richness of the Bible, uh, of a, a, a Christian, the Christian God that we serve, our Constitution and so many of our state constitutions are so rich in the Word of God, but yet that is being challenged today, and I believe with all of my heart, you and I have been born in the 21st century, some in the 20th century, and we've been born for such a time as this. And we better heed the warning to Esther. If you think that you'll remain completely silent... God will raise up someone, but you and your family may perish. For you have been placed in the kingdom for such a time as this. Great accountability on the Christians in the United States of America. And it is true, as Terry stood up here and talked about the problems in the church, it is true, the church has major, major problems. And I'll be quite honest with you, anymore I'm focused more on the remnant because we have the remnant out there that knows there is something wrong in the church. They just don't know what it is, nor what they should be doing and I think that's where you and I can step in because we have been praying and teaching and thinking and looking at these days for quite some time. We know exactly the day and time that we're living and like the sons of Issachar we do know what we should be doing. So, but as Esther I believe she did think this was a divine appointment. Do you? Do you? 
Do you consider yourself here today by divine appointment? And not just here today on this Sunday, but here, born in America during this time. We are living in the last days. God has chosen you and I to carry forth His message in these last days in a society that is, is, is quickly turning a deaf ear to the things of God. Even a church... Has, has lost her way and were, were partaking in anything and everything in the church. So I, I, I'm going to talk to you today about some things that's going on in the church, what you and I must do, because for in order for us to stand, because that's where it's all going to, we have to know what's going on. We have to understand, we have to know how to reach the people, not only just for salvation, but to reach the Christians in America with a message that God is going to restore and God can, can once again heal and God can once again bless as He used to do. And I don't know about you, but I'm talking about, I'm tired of talking about the way God used to do everything. It's time that we start experiencing the God in our own personal life that we read about in the Bible or we read about in history. Because He's still the same God. He still loves us and He's still not finished with us, but we must get some things in place. But understand, as the Jewish people were going to be annihilated, Christianity is the, the goal is to bring Christianity down because to get America to falter and history will show you this you must begin to attack the morals of a nation so therefore Christianity must be neutralized before America can be taken down and that is the goal to take America down but Christianity has to come first so every one of us has a plan and we have a purpose if you don't realize that, you need to. We're not here aimlessly walking, just filling up space and using good air. We have a plan and a purpose, and many of us, or all of us, have a general plan, but each one of us has also an individual plan. And that is for you and God to figure out. But generally speaking, we all can share in, this, in, in, in the process of what we should be doing. Doing. Obviously, we need to stand in the gap. You, you remember Jeremiah. Jeremiah, and I think maybe even Isaiah. The Lord looked to and fro. He was finding some man that would stand in the gap. And what he was talking about, someone that would stand between God and the people. Someone that would stand in the gap and petition God on, on, for the account of the people. And God said, but I could find no man. And we know the end result because there was no one to stand in the gap. We know that, that Israel went into Babylon captivity for 70 years. Well, we we cannot afford that in America. There must be someone that will stand in the gap, not between God and the people of America, because Americans are not God's people, but the church is God's people. We need someone that will stand in the gap between God and the church. The church has lost her way. Now, not everyone, obviously there is a remnant, there is a group that still loves God with all their heart, their soul and mind, but there must be someone that will stand in the gap for the church, but not only for the church, but even for the country. I will tell you, this nation is like no other nation in the world. No other nation in the world. We are still operating under our Constitution longer than any other nation has operated under a single piece of paper. We need someone to stand in the gap. And I will tell you, when you stand in the gap, even standing for our Constitution, you are standing for the things of God because our Constitution is so rich in the Word of God. Do you realize with the Word of God that, that we get our three branches of government? 
Isaiah chapter 33. Do you realize in the Word of God it's where they got the idea of not only a republic, but a constitutional republic. Whenever we see Jethro and Moses having the conversation and Jethro tells Moses, there is way too much for you to handle. Find 70 good men of good report. And they'll be rulers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. That's where this ideology came from. And then, we, you know, we've got a pretty famous document that says life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And it's in that order. We get the word, we get life from because God honors life, and, and life is very important. So we got to stand for country, but we must also stand in the gap for our family. I'm telling you, if you have children and grandchildren, you better be standing in the gap for your children because Satan is coming after our kids to destroy them. He's not coming after them. He's already got many of them and he is destroying them and he's not going to stop until he gets all of them. We must stand in the gap. We must do this. We must stand not only in the gap, but we must stand for truth. And, we, and, and not only stand, but we, we stand here for such a time as this. So what, what time are we experiencing? What's going on in America? Over the past few years, I've visited a, a, a study, and 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 the the person that I've I've read some of his material, it's really irrelevant uh, uh, whether he's a false teacher or not because I don't know that much about him. He gives historical facts, so I can read facts. So what time is it? Where and how did the church get to this point? Well, in the 90s, maybe the late 80s, there was a revival broke out in, in Canada, in Toronto, Canada. It was called the Toronto Revival. Some of you may be familiar with this revival. This revival, and I'm not going to start naming names because many of you would get upset at me if I start naming some names of the people that's involved in this. It is real. It is, it, it is scary the the men of God that's involved in this 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 movement not so much of a movement now but it has totally infiltrated the church well in the 90s that revival in Toronto came to Florida first I believe is a, a city of Brownsville Florida but then where most of you probably remember is Lakeland, Florida. If you remember that huge revival, this thing went on so long. And they, I, I remember when this was happening in the early 90s. And there was saying at that point in time, every day there was 550,000 people that were, that, that were connecting online and listening to the church services. Every single day, 500 and 50,000 computers with an audience estimated at 400 million that they had the potential to reach on a daily basis. God TV, they, they completely went off their schedule so they could air this thing every night. And this was nothing, in my opinion, but a move of Satan and how he began to infiltrate the church. If you begin to look at what had happened during that time, there was so much going on. And if you read anything about Eastern religion and even into India, into Hinduism, you, you'll read about a, a, a spirit called the Kundalini spirit. The Kundalini spirit. And the Kundalini spirit, they say it's, it's the Hindu uh, uh, version of the Holy Spirit. That with this, you, you, you have an expression of happiness, you have an expression of love, and you'll see this, but this is nothing but a false spirit. And you find people that's, that's tied up into new age and things practicing this. And I'm not going to go through all this, but we see these things, how they came and infiltrated the church. 
And we know that one person, that, that he was being backed by a, a, a large church in, in the West. And this church was going out and he was ministering to the youth people. And I and see, it, it doesn't matter what the person told me, he said. I've listened to him. I've watched him. And he was wanting to reach the young people so much he would do things like he would reach his hand down in his pocket and act like he was bringing out a joint. And then he would act, act like he was taking a draw off that joint and he was calling it toting the ghost. And the young people were falling head over heels for these things. And, 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 and the list goes on and on and on of things that begin to take place in the church. And the, the, the weird thing about this, during the, this, this Lakeland revival, and I will tell you, the person that came to Lakeland from Canada was Todd Bentley. And Todd Bentley came and he, he was coming there to preach a four or five day or night revival. And this thing just exploded. Exploded. And, and after, after a few, several weeks of this, then many of the iconic figureheads in the charismatic and the, the, the uh, uh, Pentecostal movement, these great leaders that we've had a lot of respect for, they brought this man up on stage and began to lay hands on him and prophesy over him and talk, talk about all the great things he was, had done and all he was going to do. At the time they were praying for him, they didn't realize he was sleeping with one of the people on his staff while the revival was going on. And a few weeks later, the revival ended. It, we, our, our great Christian leaders couldn't even discern what was going on. Here they are pronouncing blessings on a man that is blaspheming the things of God. So we talk about what time is it in America? Now, I hate to be the barrier of bad news. I really do. And sometimes I wish I could preach a fluff message that you would feel really good about yourself when you left and I wouldn't care that once you walked out the door, life would hit you square in the face and you would have nothing to be able to fight that with. But that's what many pastors are, are selling out for. They want you to feel good in the service so you'll keep coming back. But that is a false assumption of where the church is today. So where are we? What time is it in America? Well, I believe it can be best expressed if you open your Bibles up to Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. We know that it's dealing with the beginning now to deal with the seven churches in Asia. And the very first church on the list is the church in Ephesus. And if you'll notice that the Lord has some things to say about the church in Ephesus, but the thing that begins to stick out and, and to, to stay with us, He said, I have something against you that you have left your first love. Now, I want you to pay close attention to what the Lord said. He did not say you don't love me anymore. He said you've left your first love. I'm not your first love. You may say it with your words, but you're your actions prove otherwise. So here's the great thing. Many people in times past, thank God for them, and they had such insight in the things of God. But today, I don't need to have prophetic visions. I don't need to call myself a prophet. I've got history, and I've got real life to back up the very stuff that I'm telling you about. There was a, a George Barna, and, I, and I, I quote him quite often in this church. But about three or four years ago, he and David Barton, which David Barton, I, I, I highly respect that man. I've been to D.C. with him about four or five times and, and just love the work that he's done in uh, uh, teaching American history and, and causing Christians to engage. But they co-authored a book called U-Turn. And, and, and to promote that book, they, they started having conferences. And I drove to Pennsylvania, and I attended a conference up there in, in Lancaster. I called it Lancaster, and they straightened my language up. They said, it's Lancaster. So I went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I, I, I attended this conference. And George Barna, he began to talk about some things in his book. And he started talking about giving evidence of how America has lost 
lost her first love. Now I'm going somewhere with this. Just as Esther it was called to stand in the gap for her people, we are going to have to stand in the gap for the church because you better believe that Satan is whipping the church in America today. The Bible says no weapon shall no weapon form against us shall prosper. I'm telling you, Satan is prospering big time in American church today, and you'll have to agree with me. Amen anyway. It's happening. So here is what he come up with. He, he, he labeled things and he put them in three categories. Top, middle, and bottom tiers. That's how he labeled them. He's not polling non-Christians. He's polling Christians. So in the top of the top tier, the thing that won it out is TV. Hmm. I believe that for shut mine off. I was watching NASCAR about 30 hours a week. Your pastor was. That's why I shut my TV off. And that's why I'm afraid to turn it back on because I'd start, I'd feel like I need to make catch up. So I'd have to do about 100 hours a week. Then, now understand, it says TV, it doesn't say what. Next on the list is music. Could be Christian music. Could be country music. It doesn't say, it just says music. I don't care if it is Christian music. It cannot take priority over God. Then books. Doesn't say what kind of books, just books. Internet, law, I don't understand that one. But family. Think about it. Family runs about sixth or seventh, but at least it made the top tier. Then you jump over to the middle tier. What makes the top of the list over there? Video games. This is about four years old, so it's probably gotten worse. Then newspaper, radio, magazines, our peers, school, and here's one that I surely can't get over that's on the bottom of the list in the middle tier, others. What is others? Because we've not even got to the bottom tier yet. So the bottom tier, winning out the top slot in the bottom tier, is non-related family, then events, life, theater, literature, and at the very bottom of the bottom tier is the local church. That's what people admitted to. Now, we, we talk about uh, porn in the church, and, and I'm, I thank God that men are being honest, and the, the number comes in, the, the men in the church, about 70% every week, but they say in reality, for the ones that are not being honest, it may be as high as 85%. But now women come into the equation because now women come in about 40%. Maybe because of women's lib, you want to see if you can be a little more vulgar than we are. So we see how it, things come in in those tears. And then when it comes to ourselves. This is how we begin to stack up. The first on the list is you. You're first. I'm first. Second is consumers. Third is our career. Fourth makes the parent and spouse. Fifth is the American citizen. And sixth is Christianity. So it's proof that we have lost our first love. Not everyone. I know there are a lot of people that Christ is first and foremost. I want to tell you, Trisha's father, I don't care where you see him, and don't matter what event you're at, I, I believe I could walk up and find that man... In the, in, in, in the worst of the worst places, and he'd still be talking to me about God. Amen? Amen? If you know him, you know it to be true. So I'm not talking about everyone. I'm talking generally speaking, because this is where you and I come in. When we begin to stand in the gap, and we begin to stand for truth, we must understand what we're fighting against. 
This is evidence. And, and I love the Phillips translation of, of Romans chapter 12. I, I very seldom ever read that. But I like the way they say in Romans 12 too. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. That's exactly what's going on in the American church. We're being squeezed into the mold. How did we get here? Yes, we got there. That revival, I believe, introduced a spirit that the church thought was a Holy Spirit and was not. But it even goes back further. In the 1960s and the 1970s, even though it sounds great and it feels right, but it's totally wrong, we redefined the Great Commission you read in, in Luke's writing and in Matthew 28. We took that, you know the passage, go into all the world, preach the Word of God, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. We know that passage. But we let the world and we let Christianity or somebody redefine that in the 60s and 70s and make that an evangelistic tool. Now, that sounds great. You, you know, we, we use it as a tool to convert souls. Now, everything that we do, the focus should be converting souls, but the meat of that passage is not about converting souls. The meat of that passage is to make disciples. And Billy Graham, if he was still living today, he would amen that very passage because I heard him talk about it. That we, we begin to dummy the things of God down so much that now we just raise your hand and, 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 and repeat a prayer and, and, and don't even know what you're even saying So because we've got numbers and quotas we must, we must meet. If we're part of the promise keepers, we need to get X number of men saved in order for people to keep giving. It's all about getting numbers and many times we're not even talking to them about a commitment that they just made and they have no idea what has just happened in their life. And how many of them went because of peer pressure, really didn't even give their life to the Lord, but yet went on to seminary school, now preaching the Word of God, and the Spirit of God is not in them, and without the Spirit of God, this is nothing but a book full of words. And so, because you don't have the Spirit of God, then, then you must interpret something out of here, or you must rely on someone to interpret it for you. And it matters. This matters because we put a crack in the armor, we deviated from the truth, and now we kick that crack wide open, and now the deity of Christ is even being challenged in the church today. Do you know that of all the Christians in America, that only 9% believe in the basic tenets of faith. And I mean, 9% of the Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, that the Word of God is infallible and without error. Those are basic tenets of faith. 9% only believe this. You and I have our, our work cut out for us. We are to stand. We are to stand in the gap. We must stand for truth. One of our founding fathers, and I keep forgetting to look, look his name up, but one of our founding fathers said this, and, and I'm not quoting him verbatim, but this is basically what he said. He said, if we are not careful, we will become a people that if you know the Bible, you would be praiseworthy. In other words, he's saying one day we see if in the future that people will not know the Word of God. It means that to understand the Bible is no longer the norm. Church, we're not headed there. We're there. We are there. So what time is it? I will tell you. It's, it's time that the church, the mainstream church, is under the judgment of God. 
It's evident. We read it in the Old Testament. We see it firsthand because we're calling those things that are right, we're calling them wrong. And the things that are wrong, we're calling them right. Now, there's still some people that are called righteous, righteous, and unrighteous, unrighteous. But for the most part, the church has got this backwards. That is a sign number one that the church is under the judgment of God. Time is running out. You better believe this world is messed up. It's time to save the American church if it's going to be possible. It's time to save our community. So what must we do? Well, I touched on it. We must make a decision. Here we go, guy. We must make a decision to stand for truth. But I will tell you, it must be truth. And today, that's not as easy as you think to find the truth. Because everyone has truth. In other words, there isn't any absolute truth any longer. Truth is how I perceive it. They do this. So we must make a conscious decision, first of all, to find the truth and then speak the truth. You don't think they're changing this? I believe it was four years ago. I've, I've been to D.C. with Bart, David Barton. I think it's uh, four, four or five times. But one time I was there by myself. And I happened to be there when the Supreme Court was hearing the case. And before they started that morning, I was fortunate to get to go into the chambers. And, but before they started the case. So there was just a few of us got to go in there. And they began to name the inscriptions and, and what all these things mean that are up on the wall right above the, the, the justice head and anyway, all the way around the room. And they were wrong about it all. The thing that was the Ten Commandments, they called the Bill of Rights. And the list goes on and on. You know, if I could back up and go again, I would have stood up and challenged that. Because this is where we're headed. We're going to have to start standing up and speaking what's true. We're going to have to correct the lies that are being taught under the name of Jesus Christ. Not only in the Word of God, but also in how they're changing our history. They're doing this little at a time. And when you do this, get ready. Get ready because Satan is not going to take this lying down. We must develop an attitude that Esther had. Whenever she realized, if I go to the king without being on schedule or asked to come, then I could die. And Esther made this statement, if I perish, I perish. She began to pray and fast. She sent word to Mordecai for them to pray and fast so that she wouldn't even know how to approach the king. And then, once we make that decision to stand for truth, and I will tell you, that's digging into the Word of God, finding the truth, then we must understand we have a role to play. You do have a role to play, whether you know that or not. You have a role to play in God's plan, corporately and on an individual level. Here is the deal. Here Esther was in the comfort of the palace. This woman is being pampered. She's being pampered. She's being taken care of. She's getting the, getting the best food, the finest spices. She's got people take care of every need she has. That sound familiar? Sounds she's comfortable. Does that sound familiar? Does to me. Let me tell you, if you don't know the Burkses, we are the most we are the laziest people you'll ever meet in your life. We are so lazy, we will work ourselves to death to try to figure out an easy way to do something. Now, in these two buildings, we have ten heat and air units. Ten. And, and these, these thermostats, 
If, if they go by where the units would be, would be there and there and there and there and there and there and then all around that building over there. Ten. So what I had to do is every time before and after service, I have to go to every one of these thermostats and set them. And then some smart aleck come in here and tell me it's too hot or too cold. So I'd have to go and set it again. And then after the service, I have to walk around. I'm not going to walk like that. It's not going to happen. I've got to be comfortable. So what do I do? We put in wireless thermostats. I can set on my phone. Actually, if I get too hot up here and you see me pull my phone out, I'm turning the air down. Folks, I'm telling you, you and we make, we, make, we, we make jokes out of it, but we like the life of comfort. And I'm, <laughs> I want comfort. I want to be comfortable. But I am telling you, things are going to be uncomfortable. Even a couple months ago, our president, whenever he started this, this trade war with China and some of these other nations, even our president said, guys, this is going to be best for America, but it's going to get a little rough. He's trying to get the people prepared. It's going to get a little bit rough. That's our president saying this. Esther was comfortable. We are comfortable. And I'm telling you, she had to get to a place where she was uncomfortable. But she got there through prayer and fasting. You and I... We must be willing. First and foremost, to reverse that role where we're no longer on top of our list. We, we must stand. But, but you know, it's not just standing for the spiritual truth, but it's standing for what's good for this community and this nation because we have a responsibility as citizens. We have a responsibility to this nation. We have a responsibility to the ones coming up behind us to leave this nation in better shape than it was given to us. These are our responsibilities. And I think that we may have to give an answer to God because we've squandered so much. But if we will come together, let, let me take you back a little bit in our personal history. You remember in 2015, 2016, and, and we began to bombard legislation with phone calls uh, uh, about different things, Common Core and the transgender bathroom use and things of that nature. And then in 2016, through, through prayer and fasting and coming together and seeking God in prayer, and the Lord devised a plan for, for some of us to go to our board of directors where we, we had a book removed from, from the schools that, that was uh, uh, teaching Islam indoctrination. Now, I know at the same time, I know now that our, our Senator Alexander had just written a bill, Every Student Succeed Act, which just come right in and just countered everything that we done. But regardless, that's not the point. The point being, we came together and look what was accomplished. We asserted ourselves, not because it was my right, but being motivated by the Spirit of God with humility and the right attitude and character to carry forth a message to a community. See, our comfort, our security, and our lifestyle is have, will have to take a back seat to the Word of God and the spiritual needs of others.